people, uh, I'll admit people as they start, but um, really thrilled. We've been doing this now for two years, the Big Texas Read, uh, since the pandemic started. My name is Blake Kimsey. I'm the Executive Director of Writing Workshops Dallas. And David Samuel Levinson, um, a little while ago, well, two years, he said, hey, let's partner up with um, Gemini Inc. down in San Antonio and try and do a Big Texas Read to kind of feature Texas mm -hmm. authors, have them moderated. It's just been really, really wonderful. Um, yeah. You know, we have been supported by our independent bookstores, both in San Antonio, uh, the Twig Bookshop, and in Terrabang mm -hmm. Books. And we always like to mention Lone Star Literary. They post about this every month. They're really great about, about spreading the word. And even when we post this, uh, the, the recording of this, they're great about sharing that as well. So um, it's been really great. We also love Humanities Texas, who's given us a grant so that we can um, you know, keep this going and have great guests on. Uh, and um, also the University of Texas San Antonio Library System. They're really great about also spreading the word for the Big Texas Read. So we're very thankful to them. I, I love that I've gotten to know so many new authors through this. I'm so glad I've gotten to know Alexander mm -hmm. Vandekamp down at Gemini Inc., who I'm going to let say a few things about the, their, their programming and their literary arts center down in San Antonio. Thanks, Blake. Yeah, just briefly, I'm Alexander Vandekamp, as Blake just said, the executive director of Gemini Inc., and we are... Um, San Antonio's Writing Arts Center. And we just love doing programs like tonight where we're helping readers and writers come together. And believe it or not, we've done the Big Texas Read. April's gonna be our two year anniversary, which is kind of amazing. Um, and, you know, where I've been really, I think one thing I've been really just wonderfully surprised by, well, not surprised, it's just fed me poetically and literarily is just the wealth of writers we have in Texas and the diverse voices and just the amazing things they're all doing. So if we can do a little bit of showing a bigger light and shining a brighter star, let's see, on just the great literary um, work happening in this state, you know, that makes our day, so to speak. So I'm very psyched to have Mike Soto here, who I think is one of the most amazing titles to a book of poems I've ever read. Um, and the wonderful Sebastian Padramo is moderator. So everyone just use the chat, spread the love, you know, share comments. There'll be an audience Q&A at the end. And we're just very glad you're here and joining us. And I'm going to hand it back to Blake. Yes. Okay. So um, I get to introduce Mike and Sebastian. And Mike Soto, he's, he's up in New York now. He is the author of the chat books Beyond the Shadows, Inc. and Dallas Spleen. His debut collection of poetry, A Grave is Given Supper, was adapted for the stage in a unique collaboration of literary theater with Teatro Dallas, with recent performances in New Ohio Theater's Ice Factory in New York in July of 2021. Isles of Firm Ground, his translation of Ignacio Ruiz Perez's poetry, will be published by Deep Vellum in June of 2022. He is currently working on his second book of poetry, a collection with photographer Diego Enrique Flores. And um, tonight, Mike will be in conversation with Sebastian H. Paramo, who is a Canto Mundo Fellow and a former Dobi Passiano Fellow. His work has appeared in or is forthcoming in Split Lip, Protean Magazine, New England Review, Southeast Review, Bennington Review, and elsewhere. He is the founding editor of The Boiler and poetry editor for Deep Vellum. He is a visiting assistant professor of English at Austin College in Sherman, Texas, and we are so thrilled to have you both on the program tonight. Thank you both for being here, Mike and Sebastian, and we're looking forward to your conversation this evening. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I guess I'll sort of start by going over the format. So um, we're actually gonna maybe do things a little bit differently. Uh, so Mike is gonna read a few poems, uh, talk about the book a little bit, because uh, there's just some uh, context that may be needed to understand the book, uh, but it, uh, after the first couple of poems, we'll pause for questions. So uh, that way, you know, we can sort of sit with the poems a little bit more and, uh, you know, maybe more immediately jump in with questions, because I know it can be hard to hang on to the questions until the very end. Or at least that's what Mike and I were talking about earlier. So, uh, so definitely be thinking about questions or uh, ways that you can, can engage with the work. Um, but I'll let um, Mike start us off. Yeah, first of all, thank you everyone for coming and uh, appreciate uh, 
the writing workshops Dallas having me, Alex and David. Um, so I'm gonna be reading from the, you know, our, our book that we're discussing, A Graves Given Supper. So this is my debut collection. And um, so just a few words on the book. Um, so I'll just describe it a little bit for those who haven't read it or just to sort of start the conversation. Um, as some of you might know, like I sort of wrote this as um, putting the context of the drug war that's, you know, ongoing um, along the Mex US Mexico border and sort of setting it in a narrative of, of an Aston Western narrative um, and sort of taking the Aston Western uh, film uh, and sort of taking that framework and creating my own narrative to sort of, uh, I would say, dramatize or bring out sort of what's going on along the border and um, sort of in the heartland of Mexico. Um, so, you know, this book is sort of written in that, in the tradition of an acid Western where it's sort of subversing, subverting the traditional Western film genre of say manifest destiny, the sort of traditional hero against the savage native, um, sort of this um, life affirming um, east to west journey. Um, you know, like the acid Westerns are much darker um, there are more of a journey from life to death um, uh, many times. And in this case, my book is sort of a journey from the South to the North um, following sort of also, uh, you know, sort of the urge to, uh, or sort of an immigrant narrative. Um, so the two characters that are in the book um, are, are sort of taken from Alejandro Jodorowsky's El Topo. Um, which if you know anything about uh, the, the acid, the, the probably most exemplary acid Westerns are El Topo and probably Jim Jarmusch's Dead Man. So I wrote A Grave is Given Supper sort of in lineage with El Topo. And the two characters in the book are sort of topos in the making, um, I, I would consider. Um, and they're sort of, you know, like seeking a better life, um, living in a fictional border town, which I called El Sumidero, which is, you know, fictional, but based on Juarez and also um, Tijuana. Um, so their journey is, you know, to, you know, like survival, you know, a journey for a better life, but also the survival of their spiritual selves, um, which, I, which is something I think that I really wanted to do with this book is sort of bring out that journey, the sort of immaterial journey of why uh, people like sort of risk their lives to like cross the border. Um, so I'll just read a, I'll read a pair of poems and then we can just like talk about them. Um, so this first poem is called The Wall, commonly known as The Brow of God. And it's sort of about, you know, just how um, the different variations uh, of the wall that have sort of uh, evolved over the years. Um, but of course it's sort of fictional, but it's based on the actual wall that exists along, you know, the United States and Mexico, uh, New, between Mexico and New Mexico, California, Los Angeles and Arizona. So this is called the wall commonly known as the brow of God. In Sumidero, the wall is always looming, night and day our North Star, blunt reminder of the difference between this life and the one in the Norte. By far the reason why the ground is gutted with tunnels, decades of desperate maneuvers, so many names trapped and trying. If not a tunnel that connects a pink corner store basement to the bathroom of a Texaco, where a razor and a change of clothes wait, then a tunnel that connects a restaurant table always reserved to the empty pool of a house in Calexico, if not the tunnel that takes you to a Malverde shrine in Agua Prieta, said to be teeming with luck, then a tunnel that runs through a copper mine to a greenhouse in Las Cruces. The above ground alternatives. Snake yourself into the engine block of a truck. Agree to have your body stacked under cargo. Endure the heat rising exponentially in a trailer inching towards the border with the sea of other vehicles all in the same limbo, covering desert, valley, and mountains. The wall is an endless mind of steel east of Nogales, 
priest slabs in the worst parts of Sumidero, where many use the barrier as the fourth wall of their homes. Some sections of the wall are rigged with ground sensors and tracked by drones. And some are an open invitation to walk a cemetery of scorched sand. But the section stitched, in the, but the section stitched into the minds of everyone that lives here is a section of the wall that most have never seen, miles away where they say the wall goes into the ocean and the constant fog serves to hide that it ends or to maintain the awe of it going all the way across. Um, so that sort of gives you a sense of um, what I was trying to do with the wall. I really wanted the wall in this book to sort of be, um, I think a character in and of itself. I wanted it to sort of to be omnipresent, um, something that's just like narrating the lives of the characters. And um, I don't know, I always, um, I'm surprised when reading from this book so far, like um, how many people don't know that the wall actually goes into the ocean. Um, the border wall between San Diego and Tijuana goes into the ocean and, you know, like people like surf there, there's like a beach, uh, there's a park, uh, ironically called Friendship Park um, there. Um, and uh, I sort of took a liberty of sort of thinking that stretching my imagination of just thinking like the wall going into the ocean, like, uh, you know, thinking like, I don't know, just like the evolution and, you know, like what recent presidents have tried to do in terms of like extending the wall, evolving the wall. It's almost like this living um, techno entity. Um, so anyway, that's, um, that's the first poem I read this. So this other, the second poem I read um, sort of sets up the main protagonist of the book. Um, so, you know, in, in Spanish, we like to use the diminutive sort of affectionately. So um, again, writing in lineage with El Topo, I um, took the liberty to call the protagonist of this book, the Pito, sort of the diminutive of El Topo. And this is sort of his uh, story that sort of sets up uh, his journey at the beginning of the book. Um, the Pito. In the scorched sands outside of Sumidero, I buried my first toy and a picture of my mother, said goodbye to my father who left determined to get across the wall commonly known as the brow of God. After that, the horizon I gazed at for a grip on what to do now, next, for the rest of my life gave me nothing. All I could do was sit, duck my head into the darkness of my held knees for what seemed like hours enough to fall half asleep and dream a section of the wall shadow came over and clocked a hat into place on my head. I woke and looked up, but the monolith was gone. I stood and scanned the horizon, spotted a horse and a rider. That's when I knew the dream was real. As fast as I could, I ran in their direction. The rider, a man in a snakeskin vest, slowed down and told me, Topito, your hat is all black, so the brim and the shadow it casts will always be confused. Now a way to go unseen is yours and the inward journey possible. Now you start seeing how the flesh gets tamed. Um, and in those of you who have seen El Topo, that is sort of like, should, that scene should be familiar because I think that was directly inspired by the opening scene in El Topo where we see um, this sort of, uh, where we see El Topo sort of taking his son into the desert, sort of purposefully to like shed his innocence as a boy. Um, and I don't know, I think like, I got sort of like, I, I've referred to sort of a section of the wall as a monolith in this poem. And I think I was, while researching this book, I think I was looking at sort of the prototypes um, that were sort of being erected during uh, Trump's time as president. Um, I think they were like put up like three models, almost like they were shopping them one next after the other. And that was just like one section. I mean, the, the section of the, the, the wall that was built during uh, the Bush years and into the Trump years is sort of like this modern, aesthetically pleasing um wall that can be tracked that must you know ha has to have maintenance 
Um, and I sort of like just saw a section of it and thought like, oh, that kind of, I could sort of like transform that into like this monolith that kind of cast this shadow on the main character um, in sort of this dream state. Um, so anyway, I'll sort of like pause there and uh, I don't know if Sebastian, you want to say anything or, or we can. Yeah, I mean, uh... I mean, first of all, uh, that's already a really great sort of segue into the world of the book. And, and uh, one of the questions I wanted to ask was about, um, you know, what, how the book came together, or like how you, or especially since you introduced Topito in one of the, these poems that you just read, I was wondering maybe more specifically if you could talk about maybe the characters in the world building that you did the, uh, throughout the book. How you how you uh, put that in conversation with El Topo, um, the actual movie, and also these other things that you wanted to talk talk about, you know, or um, I guess ultimately, how did you navigate the mythology of these figures and and their struggles? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I don't know. I think I was sort of struggling. I wouldn't say struggling. I was just sort of like for the first maybe I would say four years writing this book because I think it took me the better part of like maybe seven or eight um and I think I wanted to write about the drug war just because you know like my family is from Mexico and they're from a region where you know the drug war has really affected everything you know and I sort of like all my life I've been going back and forth so I think I was sort of just writing about you know, the drug war and how senseless it is sort of, sort of became circa 2006. And um, then I came across um, Alejandro Jodorowsky's El Topo. Uh, I'd seen it before only once, but you know, like you see it again, something just sort of like clicked. And I thought like the way the movie, the film sort of uh, creates metaphor, how it's sort of like, um, really disembodies images and puts them together and disembodies like symbolism and, you know, uh, themes of mysticism. Um, and also like the way it depicts like violence and it's sort of like disturbing. I felt like it's sort of surreal and visceral at the same time. And I felt like that's exactly what we were seeing in terms of like the violence that was going on. Um, and I think like, that sort of gave me permission to, I think to like, you know, call like the nameless protagonist that was in the, in, in the book, um, Topito. And for some reason, mysteriously, I, I, I always had this character called Consuelo in the poems. Um, and yeah, I, I sort of just started, um, you know, creating that narrative and applying it to what I was already writing. And I think after that, like the book sort of came together, like like really fast um, and yeah. And I think like, but a lot of it is also like based on my tangential experience, my real experience of being in Mexico. Um, I'll, I'm obviously not directly involved in any of the things that are going on, but you know, like I think anybody who has roots in Mexico um, has, has, has sort of been affected, you know, like they're, you know, like I think how much I saw family or feel free to visit um, my mom's home state where I, it's a place where I still consider like home, it just really became affected. You know, I felt, I felt the terror, you know, and um, I felt the need to address it. And, and from that, you know, like, I think I obviously, I also don't, I'm not from Juarez. I don't know Juarez as well as I do say Laredo or Nuevo Laredo, but I could, uh, you know, like sort of approximate, um, you know, what it's sort of like, what a border town is, because I feel like I know that. Um, and I also feel like um, that because, you know, like my experience was indirect, I also felt it was also important to like fictionalize it, um, to sort of be like, uh, to not claim fact, but also like take liberties um, with like the more symbolic or metaphorical aspects of the, of the book that I was writing. Um, should I read, should I go on and like read a couple more and then we can continue? Yeah, let's go ahead and read some more. And actually, could, could, could I make a request maybe? Um, 
Sure. In addition to the ones that you were planning to read, maybe could you read um, Fog Having Tea with a Graveyard? Sure. Should I read that now? I'll just read it now. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. Fog Having Tea with a Graveyard. We caught the tombstone sleeping, or so we thought. The deeper we walked, we knew the sky had dropped down to ankles and the cemetery had company locked in. Time woven out, minutes into moments, seconds into the sheer white cloth of a cloud we now feared to part. The tombs no longer a shortcut to the other side of town where water was our mirror for skipping stones. Even the dismembered statues that became our trophies Mary, whose hand was swallowed by her heart. Our lady of the nose bitten off for spilling blossoms from her robe. Seemed to conspire with a lust that could, exist, that could exist above the moss for this morning only. And when you dared me, steal the pieces that lay broken at the feet of the headless angel with the sword. That only gave Godspeed to the mischief already sparked in my mind. But leaving made that weight come alive on my back, dragging me down, making me stagger to the space where the walls crowned with broken bottle shards paused and stepped on the same grave as always to climb out, but this time barely with what was starting to weigh, with what was starting to weigh as much as a man on my shoulders. Um, yeah, and that one's kind of interesting. I don't know, I'm like pretty heavily influenced by Frank Stanford. And I feel like that uh, title is a direct Frank Stanford, I don't know, metaphor. Um, um, so I think I'll, let me see. So I'll read, so how about, I, I'm gonna read a couple of Consuelo poems just to give us a sense of Consuelo. Um, so Consuelo is the, um, the, so there's Topito and Consuelo. And um, like I said, Consuelo was in these poems. She's like the, the I, I don't know how, somehow I just created this character and it sort of carried like the early poems forth. And I, I don't know, like, I think, uh, I sort of was writing uh, this female protagonist and she sort of carried the book for like a long time. Um, and I think uh, one of the things that is sort of interesting is uh, in the book is that, you know, like it's Topito and Consuelo eventually meet. And um, this first poem is sort of about the first time she sort of um, loses her own innocence. So, so it's sort of like a counterpart to Dobito as well. And it sort of starts on this like mistake. That's sort of what I write it as. Um, so this is called um, Blank Chapel or Consuelo's Mistake. And it's sort of like a sort of like mini biography of Consuelo. Um, the empty doorway cried escape to her by name. So she took the invitation to step in unwrap the rain from her face and wait for the storm to pay its sudden visit. But seeing the vandalized walls, a message started then smeared, the mad steering of a hand through paint. To Consuelo, the ruined whitewash was blindness smeared into sight, a rage she shouldn't have recognized, the one house of God she shouldn't have rushed into. Floors recently laid down, Walls primed just the day before, with the bust of Malverde set to arrive with the front door that afternoon. Nothing to stop her from getting closer, tasting first with her finger the glimmer and the grit. Nobody to keep her from gliding her tongue across the wall, deciding salt from the moon, what rushed leaves and laughter up the ladder of her spine, and no one with her in the silence after someone cleared their throat when at once she knew the mud her bare feet dragged the shawl she let fall on the floor that she would be pulled out by much more than her hair turning to find the faces like a firing squad armed with blanks with blame with stares 
Um, and that's sort of like the, that is, that's actually like the first poem in the book. And um, then the sort of rest of the narrative unfolds. And I sort of like, I don't know, I've always liked um, the idea of mistakes and mistake making as the beginning of something. Um, I think the, a common sort of like medit, I would say of meditation that I had like writing these poems was whenever I felt like, you know, something wasn't working or they were sort of like going nowhere. I always told myself like, well, you haven't made the right mistake yet. Um, you haven't like, you haven't like uh, found a way to like break the conventional syntax, you know, to sort of like get away from the conventional uh, meaning of words to sort of like go off into like something of, uh, you know, like more exciting. Um, so that was sort of like cool for me to sort of like think like Consuelo is making a mistake by sort of stepping into this chapel. Um, and we also have like the first um, mention of the folk Saint Malverde um, because this chapel is supposed to be like blank, um, but it's going to be um, dedicated to the folk Saint Malverde who um, is now known as the um, patron saint of drug dealers, but you know, really has like a long history um, in Mexico. So, I mean, I think like that's what is interesting to me a lot too, like folk religion, particularly the cult of uh, Jesus Malverde, because I just think it's really interesting, uh, you know, like the story behind that is sort of like based on a real person who sort of robbed from the greedy to give to the needy in a time like the early 1900s in Mexico um, when you know like that was essentially like uh, the, the, the poverty rate in Mexico was like just decimating sort of indigenous villages and these people were sort of like doing what they could to survive and out of that came Malverde, who was hanged for doing that. And he sort of became the symbol of the, of the people. Um, and it sort of like got carried on. And, you know, I guess sort of logically, like the people who, you know, had no means to sort of better themselves, but to like get involved in the drug trade appropriated him. But he's really like a folk saying of sort of like people who don't have anywhere else to go, conventional religion, you know, the government is not gonna fill their needs. So it's sort of like, um, what am I trying to say? Sort of like, um, it could be the, the cult around the folk saint uh, could be mostly made up, but I think the fact that um, people have put so much faith in this, you know, it sort of gives it the power of reality, you know, it's not an ordained saint by the Catholic Church. Um, it's sort of elected by the people and their particular need, need that's never been met by the church or state. Um, so I think, um, so I'll just read the sort of companion poem to that. So this poem sort of bookends um, the poem I just read. So in, in uh, Blank Chapel or Consuelo's Mistake, we sort of uh, get introduced Consuelo. It, she puts herself in this, accidentally in this situation. And she sort of endures this trauma by these people who seek to punish her for vandalizing this empty chapel, which, you know, she didn't do. She, she sort of got caught there. And um, consequ uh, consequently, um, the main character, the Pito, in the book is the one who vandalized the church and she ends up getting punished for it. So in this poem, sort of like if you trace the narrative at this point in the book with this poem, um, she's grown up, she's uh, gone through a long struggle. Um, her, and, her and Topito have met and they've sort of had this impossible love affair. And now she has sort of a chance to redeem herself, uh, Topito and sort of like, you know, the relationship that they had. So this is called the uh, Malverde Chapel or Consuelo's Revenge. Gratitude inscribed in gold, carefully thought out dedications on plaques for cargo passed safely across the border, black hat stuffed with dollars, copies of recently obtained deeds and passports. 
Some arrive in monster trucks, others in vintage cars with airbrushed murals on their hoods paying homage. Those who believe more and more people seek Malverde's help for distorted reasons say nothing. Don't say anything about the vendors selling keychains, Malverde wallets, the rows of plastic busts. Consuelo skirts through the crowd, moves in like a cloud over the day to darken it. She recognizes the faces, the man with a flat top with a, in, a, in a black leather jacket, the one with the face of an iguana. The other wearing mirrored sunglasses had a diamond grill that read Chango when he smiled at her. Consuelo gets close to the man with the flat top. For a moment, he stares right at her, but he can't place who she is. Consuelo holds her hand out, shows him a prickly pear split down the middle. It's ultraviolet redness, irresistible. He can't help but reach for it and shock his hand with spines. By the time he looks up, his eyes are yellow. The room is lit with faces trying not to look. And Consuelo is in the street thinking how much better the chapel looked hollowed out, the bright hum of its emptiness, the ecstasy of landing in front of those walls pushed by a storm into that space Capito had smeared, the delirium. Um, and I guess I'll just say with that poem, I feel like, I don't know, I've, I sort of had uh, this idea, you know, like the appropriation of Malverde. Um, I think like a lot of, uh, he, he sort of became known as uh, this uh, saint uh, with drug leaders, I think really through the media in Mexico, who sort of um, twisted it that way. Um, and I don't know, I sort of felt like this, this is sort of a reclamation, you know, like, uh, and I, I don't know, I kind of had fun thinking that, you know, like, um, that Malverde could be sort of appropriated for creative purposes. I mean, I guess, which I did, you know, like, I think part of the practice of writing this book is sort of like, you know, like maintaining an altar. Uh, so I maintain like an altar to Malverde and sort of, uh, came back to it as sort of some, helped me center the book and what it was about, like my intentions with it, collected objects and sort of evolved the altar. And um, to this day, I just still have one. And I think, um, yeah, I don't know. I think that that practice was really, um, I don't know, it was really formative. And I think like, I, I really couldn't have written the book any other way um, without like sort of having that practice of maintaining an altar, uh, creating one, maintaining it, evolving it. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in and um, this one I also mentioned, this, this is Malverde, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and you were also talking about the objects. I've seen, I've seen the altar at your apartment, mm -hmm. um, but like there are these objects and like in the poems that you read just now, there's all these objects that sort of seem to function as, I don't know, sort of idols or false idols or something in a way. I don't know if that's intentional, but um, just thinking about Consuelo, this character that you have throughout the book, I mean, and the things that she faces, I mean, the things that you're describing in reality, I mean, they're, they're very intense. And I would say that the poems become intense with, with that environment, uh, with that violence and that sort of trauma mm -hmm. that she faces and, and all these things. Um, it reminds me very much of uh, Gloria Anzaldúa's uh, idea of the, uh, you know, how, how we sort of traverse through trauma and through the, the psychic borders of our mind. And so much of this book feels like there's um, all these, these, these sort of psychic borders that these characters are crossing or facing, um, these sort of violations of their landscape and their, their minds. Um, so it feels very necessary to have that spiritual practice to sort of process these, these many things and this altar to sort of um, stay the faith throughout the book. I mean, because it can be really dark in, in certain moments. So I was just uh, curious if, if you know, you, you, you see that uh, working in that way or how, how uh, you see that as a sort of counter to, to some of the more intense 
things that the book deals with. Um, Cause I could also see these beautiful, I don't know if anybody has the book, but like these beautiful illustrations between the books also seem to kind of function as just kind of like meditative or like stop and reflect kind of moments in the book. So um, I don't know if you want to speak more to that or like how you see that balance happening. Yeah, well, first of all, shout out to Daniel Gonzalez, who, um, who is a print artist who did um, the, the cover. Um, I came up with a sort of a conceptual uh, sketch of, of, you know, what I wanted the cover to be. And he sort of like took it to the next level. So I'm like eternally grateful for him. But I don't know. I mean, what you were saying, I think, is like all about, for me, like transformation. Um, and I don't know, I think, I think like rituals, objects, like I, th I feel like transformation um, needs uh, an object. It helps. Um, you need some kind of material to sort of like reflect on the immaterial, I think. I mean, I think, I mean, I mean, just to like tell you my own personal experience with maintaining an altar, like I felt um, really silly at first. Um, but I thought like I have to like sort of I have to like, I, I don't know, I think that was part of the creative practice. I mean, I started it a long time ago and I, but I still remember it feeling a little bit um, silly, like, what am I doing? But also sort of like going for it and thinking like, uh, I remember a time when I kept uh, an altar to Malverde and sort of in private and was sort of like, when, you know, so when someone would come over to my place, like they wouldn't see it, <laughs> you know? Um, but then it got to the point where like everybody knows when they come over to my house that that's what they're going to see, you know, like, and I, I, I forget that it's around, you know, and I feel like a lot of, a lot of, um, I think what you're talking about to me is like, you know, just like transformation of like, you know, of suffering, you know, like enduring that and not, you know, like, I, I don't know. I mean, I think there are a lot of traditions uh, in indigenous cultures where, you know, like a shaman um, will say like, um, accept some sort of suffering, say for like humiliation um, in order to transform it. And I think that's like a really like, I, I don't know. I think that that sort of has always struck a chord for me because early, really early on in my creative practice, like I was I always carried around uh, that quote from I think Shakespeare's sonnet, maybe it's like 85. I don't know which one it is, but it's like, um, you know, how, how would this rage show, uh, I'm totally misquoting it, but it's something like how would this rage show beauty make a plea whose action is no stronger than a flower. Sort of paraphrasing that, but it's like, you know, how to take anger, how to take the suffering of the world, how to take trauma and turn it into something creative and redemptive. And I think that's like, I don't know, I, I don't want to shy, shy away from that challenge, you know, or from, from, from doing that. Cause I think, um, I don't know, I think that's part of being in a community and being responsible. And also, um, I don't know, um, I, I don't know. I think that's, that seems just like the right way to live. But also I think that that's sort of where the, where the most, um, I think the brightest creative gems, if you will, um, you know, you, you, you get those, I think, from really going deep. I mean, that, that's what I think, you know, I think like, that's why I think like, I also took Malverde as my own, because I felt like I wanted to like, go into this dark terrain. Because, you know, like, we've all seen images from the drug war, and they're really dark. And I sort of like, delved into that for the better part of a decade and to the point where I was just like uh, I didn't want to do it anymore you know because just researching that was sort of like really gruesome and dark and I felt like the violence had become senseless like in a life has sort of the value of life sort of like lost meaning so what do you do you know what do you do with that um, so I don't know that's what I think of I think that you know like Alejandro Horowski also, like, I can't escape him. He also has, you know, I think that's part of, like, the practice that he would call psychotherapy, finding some kind of correlation to some traumatic experience that you've had internally and then externalizing it some way in some kind of ritual, in a creative ritual. I mean, it doesn't have to be, like, a religious ritual. It can be something you create completely on your own, you know? Um, 
I think that there's something to that, you know, and I think like, um, I'm, I'm really interested in that. And I think like the book sort of like tried to like harness that energy. Um, I think it's, I don't know, should we, should I, if we stop there and take questions? I think, uh, I don't know, Blake, it's like about to be 45 after like. Yeah, I mean, Sebastian, do you have any other questions um, for Mike? If not, we can open it up uh, for Q&A for sure. Uh, well, I'd like to um, request a poem before yep. we get to that. Just, just one more. To, uh, can you read Everyday Tunnels? Sure. Everyday Tunnels. Explain the road held hostage by the three-legged waltz of a dog, twisting milk in his grin. Say it wasn't really a dog, but a man back for revenge and unable to lure his adver adversary out of his home. Say it, really, say it wasn't really a road, but a dream our imaginations paved. That's why our slingshots veered left and we, and we missed him every time. Explain the day we took supper for the 22 rifle, became host to the noiseless rabbits, how they arrived like thoughts into the grass we guarded and came away with the bells of three bodies gripped in our hands. Headed to the pines for a stew on branch fire, the peppers Abuelita grew in a wheelbarrow, the secret ingredient. A few spoons made us mummies trying to talk our bodies out of going blind, back and forth, wiping our brows in an ecstatic hell of found time. Explain, but it won't be enough for the dice roll that told us which rooster to dub with the razor blade, how it took only a day to train it to, to, train it to blaze its head feathers at turkeys, even the ones that, attack, that attacked Thea when she wore skirts. So many days are tunnels. At the end of one, Nets of sunlit water for bathing outside. Another leads to a flea market where all our money put together affords only one pair of boxing gloves. So we flip a bottle cap to decide who gets to fight with his right hand. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so if anyone wants to drop other questions, you can uh, put them in the chat. But I guess I'll ask one question while people are thinking of that. Um, you, so I, I guess I asked you to read that poem because I know you have uh, tunnels that figure very heavily throughout the book. Yeah. And they seem to also speak to this sort of surrealness and the sort of uh, subterranean uh, of the mind, I guess you could say. Uh, yeah. You know, how you explore, you know, how. Um, you know, the landscape and like all these people there, you know, because of the world that they exist in, you know, everything seems kind of like ominous or suspicious. Um, but th there's also some so kind of kind of some surprises in, with how you write about the tunnels and like these other figures that recur, like the horse and the rider and, um, you know, various uh, vehicles that, that some of the characters use. So I'm just curious if you could kind of elaborate on like how you see these tunnels and maybe how I guess I, I'm realizing that some of these, you know, recurring images also have to do with like sort of getting from one place to the other. So I'm, I'm wondering if that plays a role in like how these tunnels are thought of throughout the book, or if you want to elaborate on other ways that you, you've thought about that. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think first, uh, I think it was like a uh, really, uh, I don't know, I guess you could say fortuitous coincidence that, you know, like, so like in the, in the film El Topo, um, you know, El, Topos are like moles in English. And um, the metaphor is sort of uh, that El Topo is sort of like digging underground, um, sort of through the subconscious um, to sort of find uh, to surface and then sort of find an, uh, some kind of enlightenment, however twisted that enlightenment may be. Um, and I think, you know, like infamously El Chapo and tunnel digging um, became, you know, like one of the preferred methods for the drug trade uh, for people in the criminal underworld. Um, so I thought like, 
I don't know, that was just like the perfect sort of parallel. But in terms of metaphors, I mean, I thought like, you know, it became sort of like this um, sort of, uh, I would say like surreal device, you know, I thought like, that's just like a metaphor for anything, like a tunnel that connects this to that. I mean, I think like, I love that just sort of thinking about that over and over and over. And I think I still have like endless pages of free writing where, you know, I just sort of like riffed on a tunnel that connects, um, I don't know, Rilke to Rufo, a tunnel that connects uh, Nas to Lorca, a tunnel that connects, um, you know, anything, you know, it's sort of like, and then to think about, well, what does connects, what does connect that? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think um, that continues. I, I sort of can't get away from that metaphor. I think it's also like a metaphor for the subconscious, you know, which I think primarily is like, you know, what I'm interested in, in terms of like poetry. I mean, I think specifically to me, like poetry is for that, you know, like I think, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know, I'm, I'm kind of resistant to make like such a hard dichotomy, but I think sometimes I feel like, yeah, like prose tends towards um, the rational mind, the conscious mind and poetry, which tends to break the conventions of syntax um, and linear uh, sentences um, tends to delve into the subconscious. And I think like, that's why like I write poetry. Um, of course, you know, some of the best prose does both. Um, and sometimes poetry doesn't contain as much poetry as narrative does. So, you know, it's flexible, but I mean, I think like, th that's why I think tunnels are so present. I think like the subconscious, um, the, you know, what's was already you know, like, a, a, a theme in that Alejandro Jodorowsky's film and then sort of like that parallel with the criminal underworld. Um, so yeah, that's. Thank you. Um, there is a question from the audience that was just messaged to me, but um, so in terms of research, what were some of the resources you used for your collection? So I know you, you talked about some research already and I know you, uh, you're, you're basing a lot of the book on um, drug tr war and, and El Topo, so, but I'm curious if there's like other research that you did or like field research or anything else that you'd like to mention? Yeah, well, I mean, I, th I think I owe a huge debt to Sam Quinones. Um, True Tales of Another Mexico is an amazing book about the sort of unusual uh, place that Mexico is, specifically along the border. Um, he's an amazing uh, journalist. Um, and he was the first one to sort of like frame the narrative of Malverde um, and sort of like, you know, to me, like frame the narrative of like the, the rampant um, killing of women along the border, um, which is, you know, something also that I sort of like touch on in the book. Um, so, I mean, I, I think I sort of just was everywhere. I mean, I, I like anything that sort of was written on the drug war from blogs to Twitter feeds um, to, to like video, um, I researched and sort of like uh, uh, try to get what I could from it. You know, like I think, I don't know, I felt like I had to cut it off at some point. I mean, the one book that I really wanted to read um, that I didn't get to read before I wrote this book was uh, Bolaños 2666 which really takes a, you know, I think that book is like fascinating because I think Bolaño pre-internet um, had access to a criminal investigator along the border who was investigating um, the, like all these like homicides. Um, but I mean, I, I, I also have to say like that before I even started making this about, you know, the drug war in Mexico, um, I don't know, I, I spent like five years going to, um, the indigenous regions of Michoacan. That's where my family is from. Um, and I, I sort of came upon this knowledge that sort of in the backyard of the little town where my family is from are some of the more, I would say, colorful and true to pre-Hispanic 
um, rituals of the Day of the Dead that take place. And I sort of found that out and I was like, wow, that's right. <laughs> that's literally like a 15 minute drive where my family's from. And I was like, I have to go. And I felt like a lot of the imagery um, from the book is also taken from that, from, from seeing over a period of five years, I got lucky enough to sort of like make really good friends, um, you know, with a group of women who were wired into the Purepecha community in Michoacan. So every year I would just go and we would go to different communities to see how they, um, how they sort of celebrate the day of the dead. Um, so I sort of got like a really a close uh, look, I would say at the more like uh, pagan rituals of the day of the dead, you know, no iconography, no images, just really traditional, um, you know, like, uh, the, and, and it's like two strains, you know, like the, the communities that sort of light up their cemeteries all night to mourn their, their loved ones in the cemeteries. Um, uh, that's like, that, that was like amazing thing to sort of just like see with my own eyes. Um, and also um, to go into these small towns and, you know, like if you're, if you're mourning a loved one that year, you're, you sort of line your doorway with marigolds. And that means that um, that family is mourning a loved one and they've made an altar in their homes and everybody's welcome to come see it. And also to, you know, enjoy like food and drink in there. Um, so, you know, my friends would go and um, I don't know, it, that, that also like fed into, you know, this practice of like altar making. And also with the Day of the Dead, I mean, I think one of the more extraordinary things that being in, in the, like the, in the intimacy of one's home and seeing literally like their really deeply personal art of, I mean, if you want to call it that, they're making this altar, there are rules to it. You know, you have the marigolds, you have tapers, you have food, you have um, the picture of a loved one. Um, and it's like this cornucopia around uh, this picture to remember a, a loved one. And I feel like, um, it's just another, it's just such a deep sense of remembering someone that's passed away that I, I mean, I was just like, I mean, that's why I kept going every year because I was so touched, you know, it was just like, um, <laughs> I mean, I hesitate to call it art, but it's just like art, on a, it's something that art doesn't do, you know, and I felt like, um, but it still is an art, you know, it's, some, it's a, like a deeply, it's the, deepest personal art that I've witnessed in my life, you know, and yeah, I was really touched by that. And that sort of, though, that's the themes of the book are, uh, you know, definitely try to sort of capture the, that sort of, um, I would say ecstatic form of remembering. Um, so, yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you. And thank you to Dario for that question. Um, but yeah, just what you were saying reminds me of how that speaks maybe to the title about feeding the grave, maybe mm -hmm. kind of like feeding the, the darkness, I guess, and, and making something of it. So that's kind of what you were just saying speaks to me and, and connects to me with how I'm understanding the title of Grave is Given Supper. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I don't know if anyone yeah. else has other questions or, or if you want to... Uh, I don't know, riff off of that. Oh yeah, I mean, I'll just say like, yeah, that, that was, it's, it's weird that sort of like, a, that came, you know, our old mentor, Tom Lux, uh, I came up with that title in his workshop and it was just sort of, it was just an exercise that I gave myself, like try to write a story in one sentence. Um, and I wrote a sentence that's just, uh, just like in this, in the cemetery, a grave is given supper. I sort of just shortened that. But yeah, I mean, you're, you're exactly right. I think that also became just an ongoing embedded metaphor for like writing this, like, uh, you know, like what, is, what does that mean? Um, and I think like the juxtaposition, I mean, I think that's also why, why I really wanted to see those uh, indigenous forms of celebrating the Day of the Dead because I really wanted to tap into that sort of, if I could, that sort of pre-Hispanic notion of the juxtaposition between life and death, you know, like 
uh, and I think, I don't know, there's something to that. There's something really um, life affirming about, you know, like being on the edge of like that edge between life and death. I mean, I think it's, uh, um, I don't know, like the, the Spanish were like shocked when they, when they saw that it, it was, they thought it was like an inverse world, a hell, you know, um, but it's really not, you know, and I think like that duality is sort of like so present in, uh, you know, pre-Hispanic communities. Um, so yeah, I try to tap into that. Yeah, excellent. Um, well, it looks like, I don't uh, know if we have more time. We have two minutes left. I don't know if anyone wants to drop a question in or if, um, see, there's a, there's a comment from uh, Stacy about, um, you know, do you, do you see this as a form of ritualistic or a ritualistic form of art? Um, she's especially interested in the powerful imagery used in the poems, going back to the trips you took to the indigenous village. Is there a connection between those visits and the artwork in the book? Or if you want to talk more about how the artwork came to be, like, especially the, the, the ones that are between some of the sections? Sure. I mean, yeah, I mean, I think I, I, I don't think I had this, I think what pleases me about the book now that it, you know, it was turned into a stage adaptation. And I think like, I, I do feel like the book is more of a communal object. And I, I would hope that this book is sort of like a communal object. Um, and I think well, that's one of the things that pleased me about it being stage is sort of like Elena Hurst and Claudia Costa who are my collaborators. Um, I felt like they took real ownership of the book and, you know, um, took sort of the stage adaptation to the next level, you know, like I think Elena Hurst, the actor who played Consuelo and Tepito in the play, I mean, she just um, took the words that I wrote to another level where I felt like, yeah, they're, 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 they're hers now, you know, she owns these poems in a way that I could never. Um, and in terms of the artwork, I mean, I think, um, to me, like a, a lot of this has a uh, personal meaning to me. I mean, I think if you've been to a home in rural Michoacan, you're gonna see cups nailed to the wall. Um, the sacred heart is really important to me as a symbol and this sort of surreal image. I consider the two hummingbirds to be Topito and Consuelo. These are marigolds, which are, you know, like the path, um, the dead walk to get back home traditionally in, uh, celebrations of the day of the dead. And this is sort of a quarter moon, uh, it's already a waxing uh, gibbous. So it's about to be full. Um, I mean, those are personal meanings, but also I think like, I think one could draw uh, their own meaning from it. And, you know, like the illustrations in between were taken from a painting from Julio Galan called Tanje, Tanje, Tanje. And that's sort of like, thought about this because it, uh, it was also a table and behind it is an ocean. And I felt like I wanted to keep sort of a theme but not be so prescriptive about it with the grave is given supper, like a table and the table where you make an altar became an also a metaphor. So I wanted the book to be an art object, you know, and um, I also wanted an illustration, I think, uh, one of my favorite um, album covers is uh, uh, Blind Joe Death by John Fahey, like that blue and white cover. And I sort of wanted that feel for it. Um, so I wanted, you know, the illustration to sort of evolve, um, sort of like there's one object in the first part in sort of like this wind um, that Daniel illustrated. And then there's another sacred heart that appears for the second section, um, the wall is here, Malverde appears. Um, and you know, like the different symbols sort of change in one instance um, with Malverde, a gun is present to sort of symbolize violence. And in another instance, a pomegranate is present to sort of symbolize um, abundance. Um, and in the end, um, I think I wanted the last illustration to be sort of this portal, implied portal right here, where there's nothing. 
um, and you just sort of like, there's sort of an empty doorway um, sort of that we see in the first poem. So yeah, I mean, I think I, I, a, lot, a lot of it is, uh, I wanted it to be sort of, it seems kind of subject to me, but I think also like, you know, anyone can draw their own meaning from it. Um, and yeah, I don't know, I think, you know, shout out to, to like Deke Vellum and Will Evans who, you know, like really allowed me to do that. You know, I think like he gave me liberty to sort of like make the book and, you know, uh, fulfill the vision completely as I saw it. So that was really fortunate. Yeah, uh, yeah, and, and thank you for mentioning that thing about the communal object. I could see that resonating. I mean, especially with a book like this, it's very wonderful. Um, there's a couple of questions uh, left, but I'll, I'll kind of maybe combine them into, into one, but they're from Coleman and Alexandra there. Um, Basically, I guess about your your future plans. Like, you know, do you do you plan on using, uh, you know, this ritual or spiritual practice for your next book? I know you're working on another book. And then um, the other questions related to the is there will there be another theater adaptation of A Grave Is Given Supper? But I know that you you've you've kind of mentioned that you're doing like a screenplay version maybe. But um, so maybe just kind of just generally talk about future plans with your future projects and your future practices that maybe you'll carry with you. Yeah, sure. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm working on a screenplay, uh, like a real screenplay of the book. Um, we're sort of on, uh, like I, I would say our creative team is sort of on hiatus because uh, I think Elena Hurst, um, uh, she was in Twilight Los Angeles, uh, 1992, which was like a Broadway uh, uh, adaptation here in New York. And, you know, so she's busy with that. I mean, she's, you know, uh, so I think, uh, I think we want to come back to it for sure. Um, so the, the challenge is always like how to keep something like that going, you know? <laughs> so I think we're due for a collaborative meeting. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm totally interested in sort of evolving it. Cause I think, you know, like, I think like, yeah, it's, I always thought of it as a book, but also something that someone could adapt that I could adapt that sort of someone could also like interpret on their own. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think like uh, in terms of like rituals and creative practice in the future, I mean, I think that will also, that will always be a part of my practice. You know, I like I said, I think I went from maintaining an altar to sort of being sort of like shy about it to now it's just like part of what I do. And I think, uh, so the work, the book that I'm working on, um, incorporates photographs and uh, poetry. So, and it's, I, I'm working with my long-term collaborator, Diego Enrique Flores, and um, I don't know. I mean, it, it's hard to say where that will go right now, um, but I, you know, I'm sort of playing with sort of this idea of like a fictional witness to real things, you know, like if you have a photograph, the fact of a photograph, remains no matter which way you twist it, you know, like a, a photograph is sort of an undeniable fact, um, but how do you, how do you incorporate that into a narrative of poetry? Um, and I think, you know, like um, interpret, in, uh, putting your interpretation into a sort of narrative, something that I think I'm sort of challenging, challenging myself to do. Um, so that's like the next project, um, sort of like, too green to sort of talk to more about. Um, but I don't know, I mean, I'm really interested in, uh, I'm really interested in hearing what other people think about, you know, that their, their practices of, of sort of incorporating ritual into a creative practice, you know, I think, where does that go? I think, you know, like, I guess we could say the pandemic is ending for now. Um, we're sort of opening up I'll be reading in public soon. And I've always been interested in what I would do with the gravest given supper in public. Like, I would love to, I, I had uh, sort of ideas to sort of be, to, to appropriate a space and build an altar and have a reading, you know, ideas like that. I mean, where like, 
We did that in the first iteration of the, the, the stage adaptation. We encouraged people to add things to the altar we built to sort of mourn the people that they, have may, that they may have lost during the pandemic. Or we just gave them flowers to place on the altar. I, I don't know. I mean, I think uh, the, the communal aspect of art, I think, has never been more important. Uh, we're obsessed with authorship and credit and fame. Um, and I think all those things are fine, but you can also include, um, how can you include more people, you know, in a more intimate way? How can you be co-creative with um, the audience? Um, I think this time is really right for that. I think, you know, you know, we've been forced to be hermetic and now we're sort of like, hopefully can take this new energy and smash old conventions um, instead of like coming back to the old ones we can sort of um, I don't know create new spaces for meaning because I think we I think we need that and the communal aspect to me I think is one of the things that should definitely be in the conversation of like the evolution of any kind of art form yeah thank you um I think that's all the time we have left, but uh, thank you to Gemini Inc. and Writing Workshops Dallas, Blake and Alexandra, y'all are amazing. And Mike, thank you for asking me to be involved and thank you for, to everyone for being here. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for doing it. Yeah, thank you all for being here tonight. Um, this was just a great discussion and I, you know, I love how cinematic your book is, Mike, you know, from reading it and just everything you're doing with it, giving it the life, you know, kind of going forward. And I just so appreciate all the things you talked about, about the nature of art and community and um, just bringing those things to light tonight. So thank you all, you know, for being here, uh, Sebastian and Mike. Thanks for such a great, thoughtful conversation about your work and everything else. So um, wishing you all the best. Thank you all for tuning in on a Wednesday night in March. And um, from Jim and I Inc. to Writing Workshops Dallas and David Samuel Evanson, you guys be good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks everyone, this was great. I, I'm a lot of food for thought. Then that's not meant to be a pun off your amazing title, Mike. <laughs> but that's um, really, really interesting stuff. Yeah, thanks so much. I just loved listening into this. Thank you. Yeah, thank y'all. Thank you.